It's Josh and Frankie with a couple of dumb shits. Hello, primates! You found Primus Tracks. Congratulations. This is not the only place to find us. We are at Primus Tracks on Instagram and threads. Primus Tracks pod at gmail.com is the email address for your email related needs. And there is a Facebook page run by someone other than me. Uh, and if you search for Primus Tracks on Facebook, you'll find that page where all kinds of stuff is posted. Once again, not by me. So I might as well bring in the guy who does it. I am Josh, and the maestro behind the Facebook page, and many other things here at Primus Tracks is Frankie. Hi, Josh. Welcome back, Frankie. Today, we are talking about lights in the sky. Not literal lights in the sky, unless you want to go there. Uh, but it's track nine on your Les Claypool Frog Brigade Purple Onion album. But as so often happens, Frankie, we have miscellaneous debris. Our first piece of miscellaneous debris is about us. Uh, I finally got off my duff, Frankie, and created a T Public page. Ooh, where uh, you know, for those of you that want the Primus Tracks logo or Frankie's drawings on a pillow or a kitchen apron or your coffee mug or any other useless piece of junk or even a T-shirt, uh, go search for Primus Tracks on T Public, and you you can purchase all kinds of crapola with uh, our drawings and logos and whatnot go to i don't have a url it's the uh, it, it of course they make it a complicated url so just go to tpublic.com search for primus tracks you'll find it one of these days frankie i'll even do a link tree for us which makes it easier to access those different oh, places imagine that. i think i started and then gave up uh for whatever reason Someday, Frankie, we're, we're slowly building. Much like Primus Tracks Towers wasn't built in a day, neither will be <laughs> our link tree. Uh, second piece of miscellaneous debris, uh, we received a message from a, a youngster, I actually don't know if they're a youngster, named Tim Wiz on Instagram. Tim says, this might be a little bit behind as far as your episodes go, but on the No Force Field episode, you guys were referencing tracks and one of them was ladies night in buffalo that's actually the name of a david lee roth song from his album eat em and smile i did not know that frankie as i am not a david lee roth fan incredible so of course we have to sample the tune frankie david lee roth is just uber horny and i don't want to hang around horny guys all the time but let's listen to a little bit of ladies night in buffalo it sounds exactly as you'd expect Twelve seconds in, he's making those horny noises. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate that. That's it for miscellaneous debris. So let's turn our attention to the lights in the sky. A little bit about lights in the sky, Frankie. It is track nine on the Purple Onion record. It checks in at four minutes and 34 seconds. Credits are as follows. Les Claypool, bass, vocals, and percussion. Steamy Dean Johnson plays the drum outro. Enor is on guitar and background vocals, Skerrick on fancy sax, and Mike Dillon on vibraphone and metal. Interesting. Cool. I have a feeling your essay will enlighten us about this track. First of all, um, I want to point out that it's a pretty rare track. It was not brought back uh, for the last year frog brigade run uh nor was it performed that much when the album came out so the song was premiered on june 28 2002 which means we missed the anniversary by a couple of days but it was premiered at boston in the fleet boston pavilion between 2002 and 2003 lights in the sky was performed only 17 times wow Considering the hundreds of shows that the Frog Brigade played, I would say that this is one of the rarer songs in their catalog. 
especially from this record, uh, as we look down the track list here, most of these are mainstays in the Frog Brigade set lists. But this one, exactly. you're, you're saying only 17 times, and only between 2002 and three. That's right. And so it's been over 20 years since anybody has heard this song live. And it was only teased for the last time in 2005. So we're talking about pretty rare territory here. Wow. Well, if you experienced Lights in the Sky live, please email us, primustrackspot at gmail.com. I need to know how eerie and creepy it was in a live setting. Uh, because that, of course, is <laughs> what they're putting out there uh, on the studio record. Wow, Frankie, so we don't have a lot to go on. I know we do have a live cut today, one of the 17. Yes, an example of the way that the track was uh, performed. The thing about Lights in the Sky is that I don't know if I could refer to it as a jam vehicle when it was, <laughs> when it was performed live, because... It, it, it was extended for quite a bit during the live performances. Of course, it was not performed as per the album version. But the thing about it is that it didn't actually serve as a springboard for some kind of improvisation or a, a lot of jamming. It was actually kind of a very atmospheric thing. So much like I consider it a palette cleanser on the record, it kind of served the same purpose in a live environment. Sometimes it was performed prior to other more upbeat songs. Okay. But there were shows where it was actually performed back to back with songs like 2000 Light Years Away From Home, Cosmic Highway, or even David Bowie cover of Space Oddity. So I think there were some shows where they were trying to make kind of a statement with this song and the others, right? There was a space theme going on. But yeah. I would say that Perhaps the show is where it was performed is because Les was feeling the audience and he thought that it might be welcome. But I guess that at shows where he perceived that people were in the mood for something more upbeat, they didn't, they didn't even go close this one. Okay. The, that is fascinating that he would pair it with tunes like 2000 Light Years and Space yeah. Oddity and Cosmic. I think that's great. Uh, so there is, there is that through line, that thread. And it, it is. It holds thematically as well. That's really fun. Uh, and I think that can help provide perspective on what this tune is about, I suppose. Uh, because these lyrics, and I know I'm jumping ahead, but these lyrics, I would call them the most generic lyrics on the record. Uh, and so, and quite vague, actually, um, in as far as sensory details and and information and that sort of thing that you get from lyrics so it uh it but it's certainly there's enough there that it makes sense to pair this tune with those other ones that were mentioned in a live setting uh and i should mention too that the live track that you provided today frankie is 18 minutes long that gives you an idea of where this track would go to in a live setting <laughs> They certainly are taking us to outer space with an 18-minute lights in the sky. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Goodness. Well, we're going to listen to the whole thing right now. I wanted to to point out, Josh, that, well, you, you already mentioned the lyrics, but I wanted to say that in terms of instrumentation, yeah. as it's a very percussive track, but it has a very peculiar percussive sound, it reminds me a lot of shadow of a man by oyster Heath. oh okay so you make the shadow of a man connection with the percussion um i can hear that actually we should all hear that let's listen to the intro to lights in the sky i mean we we all have a good idea of shadow of a man at this point especially well it's, it's yeah. especially in the middle okay is where it reminds me of of shadow but yeah you can sample any part you choose well, let's hear that intro because the, uh, of course, with most tunes, you get uh, a sense of where it's going in the first 30 odd seconds. And this one is no different. Uh, and in fact, this one immediately uh, creates an atmosphere that is readily apparent. E minor. Dropped out, rest up right. 
probably should try and leave town tonight. I've got a dollar bill, you've got a fine. Damn good to be alive. All right, we should talk about the percussion. And so those those toys, the metal, I suppose, and that Mike D's doing and uh, the percussion that Les is doing, uh, do, I think, could evoke the, the shadow of a man percussion as Stuart's playing on all kinds of things. Uh, and then I just wanted to mention those vocal treatments there right at the end of that clip. Uh, Les is obviously having some fun with uh, some effects on his voice. And so <laughs> that, that part always makes me smile. Uh, yeah, L- let me point out a specific part for you. Please. Just two minutes, 45 seconds. Let's hear Frankie's Shadow of a Man connection. I think I hear it there. I'm, and Stuart's a little busier with his toys. Yes, yes. But the sounds are similar, I think. Very it's atmospheric. Absolutely, eerie. yes. Eerie is is the word uh, that I would like to use as well to describe this track, especially throughout uh, the, the atmospherics. Uh, just to kind of run it down, we have that really snappy high register bass part uh, in E minor. I was... It's funny because we've said this a lot over the last couple albums, and I'm going to use air quotes. Les's line, bass line is simple, and then it allows uh, the other participants to build off of it. Um, and this one, I, I, I think, is no different. This is a this is one of those examples of a quote unquote simple bass line uh, in E minor that uh, just allows everybody else uh, space uh, to create something. Uh, Skerrick's layered background sax. Fancy sax, I should say. You know, he's making those barge or train honk noises uh, at the beginning, and then uh, he provides melody support in the middle, and then near the end, he he gets to let it rip a little more. Um, and then that percussion that Les and Mike are doing, there's there's the toys, and then and then there are those uh, deeper drum percussion flourishes that I think create some counterpoint. Another thing I really appreciate is Enor's background vocals. He just his voice just provides a different register and a different uh, different approach. Once again, there's a lot of layering happening, and uh, I'm actually going to go back to about one minute and twenty three seconds because there's this one spot uh, where Mike D plays a marimba chord and then uh, puts it to the pedal so that it uh, that it wobbles a little bit and sustains, and it's a really satisfying sound. That right there, so satisfying, uh, and once and just another little piece to provide some more tripped out atmosphere um, for this tune. And so, uh, you know, we talked about uh, a lot of structure to the tunes on Purple Onion. This one is structured uh, as well, but it does at the same time feel a little more experimental. Uh, and the reason I say that, Frankie, is. Uh, at about that two and a half minute mark, uh, right around where we played your Shadow of a Man connection, um, through that part, I think, oh, this this song's about to fade out uh, because it's the the structure is loosening. They're not playing full throated, and it just sounds like right here. This is where the tune should start fading out. It's been two and a half minutes. We get the gist of the tune. So right around here, the tune should probably start fading out. Right there. We should, right? We're fading out, or we're ending. But it keeps going. (laughs) And then after some meandering, we get this uh, transition uh, to the outro... Uh, that certainly uh, takes us to a different place. Maybe onto the spaceships.
And then we get a pretty satisfying ending, in my uh, opinion, with Dean Johnson coming in on the drums and a bit of a drive now. We get a little more purpose, I suppose, behind what's being played. Props to Les for holding that note a really long time, that me. You know, this is this one is a satisfying track, Frankie, and it is, as you mentioned, a bit more uh, slower paced, a bit more atmospheric. It's not a dance number by any means, but it's satisfying. So uh, I wonder what's working for you with this one, because I, I talked about Dee's Diner being back in my younger days, being my skip track. This one I never skipped. I thought it was great uh, when I was listening to the record uh, as a whole. Uh, but what works for you with this track? Uh, the vocals. Uh-huh. I think they are uh, really great. The way that Les emphasizes the word makes makes the story compelling, even though it is vague, as you mentioned. And for me, it's it's pretty much a cleanser because you have two really strong tracks. I mean, at least this diner is a strong number for me on the record. I really love that song. Mm-hmm. And then track 10, we know that it's an iconic Les Claypool adjacent number. So I think Lights in the Sky is the perfect cleanser between both songs. This is a record where Les does not give you two two consecutive punches, right? Yeah. So he gives you an incredible song, and then he lets the record breathe, and then we're back to another compelling number. So that's the way that Lights in the Sky works for me. Is it a song that I reach for to listen to on its own repeatedly? Not really. I enjoy it in the context of the record. When the album is going Mm -hmm. back to back, I enjoy listening to it because I don't listen to it otherwise. So it that has kept it very fresh over the years. Even still relatively unfamiliar because of that reason. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's compelling in a different way, right? So the D's uh, is compelling in its own way. Lights is dynamically different. Uh, Up on the Roof is, as the kids say, a certified banger. Uh, And then we go on to (laughs) David McAllister 2, which serves as a pseudo bookend uh, for David McAllister, uh, the second track on the record. So uh, what I'm finding is this record is quite dynamic, and so many of these tracks are uh, interesting in different ways. It's not like, say, a generic thrash metal album where every single song is a million miles an hour, and that's all you get. This one has a lot of different flavors to it, or layers of the onion, I suppose, which I haven't said that in a few tracks, so I'm glad (laughs) I'm coming back around to that metaphor. That's actually actually something that I discovered uh, with time in terms of the way that a record is laid out and the way that it's sequenced. Uh, For many years, I didn't understand why I felt so exhausted listening to the first Teen Machine album by David Bowie, because I told myself, I I like each of the tracks on the album. There really aren't tracks that I would particularly skip, but it is relentless. So you, there's no space to breathe on that record. It's like one really in your face track after another. So it, it's kind of exhausting to listen to a full record like that. And with Purple Onion, Les was really brilliant in the sequencing because we have lights in the sky um the other one that we discussed in the same vein would be long in the tooth right sure yeah so you have at least two cleansers that let the record breathe and i think that's dynamically that is really good for a record and it makes you come back to it more often i think i would have preferred it if we had just had 12 tracks of whamola (laughs) <laughs> no, this is great. I do like the dynamics of this record, and I think that's part of the reason why it's so strong uh, as we make our way through it. Uh, or something that you mentioned reminded me that I haven't listened to Lights in the Sky in a while either. Uh, this is a record that I listened to a whole lot 20-odd years ago when it was released and in subsequent years, but it's not one that I've come back to of late. And I think that's one, that's something I've found uh, as we're making our way through this podcast. I go, wow. I haven't listened to this record in a while. And so it is really nice to revisit a song like Lights. And I was reminded that there's a lot more going on in this tune than I remembered. And so you're right right, that it does freshen it up uh, for a listener, even even a seasoned uh, listener such as yourself, Frankie, that you you can come back and go, oh, yeah, there's these really cool Skerrick honks or this little uh, Mike D. Marimba flourish. And then Dean Johnson comes in with this drum 
part at the end. I'd completely forgotten about that. Uh, so there's there's a lot uh, to chew on uh, in this track. And I want to play a little bit more of the outro uh, because there's a song that I connect this to, maybe not by any tangible means, uh, but I'll play a little bit of this one and then a little bit of the other, uh, and we'll see if I can quantify it. Sure. I really like this part, by the way, uh, when the drums kick in. That bass part that Les is playing right there, I think, is the connection. uh, Because there is a guitar line in the track that I'm about to share that is similar. uh, And I think maybe that's the the thread that connects them for me. Now, once again, I haven't listened to it in a long time. Many years ago, I started associating Lights in the Sky with the host, the ghost, the most holio from Captain Beefheart's album Ice Cream for Crow. So if you listen to the guitar part here in the intro, I think that's the connection between uh, this one and the bass part on Lights. Why not even the rustler to have anything to do with this branded bumsteer world? By the way, I'm a huge Beefheart fan, and I know Les has heard Beefheart over the years, but I don't know that he is anything more than a casual listener. So there's probably no connection musically other than coincidence that they kind of have that same lulling uh, lilt to them, and uh, that's just where I drew a similarity. Love that Beefheart track, by the way. That record, Frankie. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Ice Cream for Crow for me was, uh, I'd say, 2006 when I was going through my graduate program. For some reason, that album resonated with me, and so I had those songs in my head quite a bit. I like that I could connect those two artists, them being two of my favorites. So it's really great to, to make those connections, uh, however tenuous, but there it might be. So that's where my mind great, It is a great connection, as um, a matter of fact. Thanks, Frankie, and I recommend everybody go out and buy Ice Cream for Crow by Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band, uh, and uh, so Beefheart's estate can get a few pennies. Let's talk a little bit more about those lyrics. Now, I did mention that it, they are, to me, the most generic lyrics on the record, and really, up to this point in, in the Les Claypool discography, these are some of the more generic lyrics. We don't have a character, we don't have a narrator who's telling a story of folly, <laughs> or or some kind of failure, or some kind of cautionary tale. Uh, we don't have wacky commentary and that sort of thing. We just get a vague depiction of paranoia and some kind of possible abduction, I suppose. Uh, but whatever the case, they're not incredibly developed lyrics. But, Frankie, we do learn that between the narrator and ourselves, we have six bucks. And that's pretty important, Right. And I'm the one with the fiver. <laughs> so so I can get myself something. I'm not sure. That's the impression I've always had from the lyrics, that it's an abduction. It's Me, a song yeah. about a UFO. This narrator is out somewhere. The eyeballs, I suppose, with the gaze of the lights uh, upon him. But yeah, these lyrics uh, are... And they're quite brief, aside from the chorus. We get propped up, dropped out, rest up right, probably shouldn't try and leave town tonight. So propped up, dropped out, rest up right, I have no idea. Um, It sounds like uh, somebody's already tripping balls, though, if you're propped up and dropped out. Uh, I've got a dollar bill, you've got a five. It's damn good to be alive. Uh, look up, look out, look in and see. I like the repetition of the looks there. I do believe there's somebody eyeballing me. Uh, If I move to the left, do you move to the right? As in, do you mirror what I'm going to do? Probably because I'm being watched. And then no matter where I jump, I'm still locked in their sights. And then we get that chorus. The lights in the sky keep calling my name. They're calling my name. I think they're coming for me. Uh, So once again, very brief. Uh, And... 
and vague. But at the same time, Frankie, I should give uh, some slack to these lyrics because probably the most scariest thing, and I think I've said this in this podcast before, the scariest things in human history are the dark and the unknown. These lights in the sky, we don't. Uh, the narrator doesn't know what they are, essentially. And he doesn't say they're aliens. He doesn't say they're government agents. He doesn't say they're shadow people or anything like that. We don't know what they are. And so that unknown uh, quality of the threat is in and of itself quite frightening and terrifying, I suppose, for the person who's experiencing this. Um, and we mention many times... We've mentioned the X-Files, Frankie, and so this makes me think of the Dwayne Barry episodes. Dwayne Barry had this abduction experience, um, and so when he saw the lights, he knew what was going to happen. I love going back to the Dwayne Barry episodes because they are a great thought experiment in individual perception and point of view as to what's true, what's not, and what people's lived experiences actually are uh, and are like. Um, And that got me thinking, Frankie about alien abduction movies and TV shows. Obviously, X-Files is top of the heap for me. But I wanted to quiz you or ask you about some of your, and they don't have to be your top ones, but what are some memorable alien abduction movies or shows that you're into? Because this, I think this is a topic we're both uh, interested in. Not uh, movies or TV. I mean, I love X-Files, but mm-hmm. not movies or TV shows in particular. I'm more fascinated by some of the some of what I consider to be the most convincing or disturbing cases of abductions documented in history. Uh, one of them, of course, being Pascagoula, 1973. Yeah, will you remind me about that one? Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker uh, were abducted and examined by three beings, which they described as three entities with no eyes on their faces, very small mouths, uh cones uh, coming out of the place where their nose and ears should be very wrinkled elephant like skin claws instead of hands and after they were examined uh inside a ship they were returned to the to the place where they were fishing apparently unharmed but they stuck to their story for the rest of their lives they never modified any details they never made any money out of uh you know, any kind of merchandise or any opportunity to be on TV. It actually took them a very long time to talk about it uh, openly. And Hmm. I think it's one of the most interesting cases because of the the description of the entities. I mean, we're used to aliens being described as, you know, the gray little beings with big insect eyes. But something like that, I think it's terrifying. So it really stands out. And there are many other cases just like that one, which I find really, really fascinating. So, so you're sitting there on the mutual UFO network message boards, just waiting for for just <laughs> waiting for an interesting story <laughs> to come up. <laughs> uh, that one, yeah, I remember the details of that one now that you you describe it. And uh, so the the ones that come to mind for me as far as film and TV show depictions of this kind of thing, of course, Close Encounters of the Third Kind is is top shelf. I really wanted Fire in the Sky, that film, to be good. And it mostly is. I would say it, it, it's a really good film until the main character, and this, of course, is based on a true story, uh, until the main character is in that sli- slimy alien cocoon business. And that scene seems to last forever. And it turns out that's not even what the guy supposedly experienced. <laughs> the, I think the filmmakers just thought they needed to gussy it up for for the movies and so that whole thing was just tacked on what i think is effective about fire in the sky is uh is everything else that these guys are completely unsure of what happened to them and of course there there have been efforts to debunk their story uh but a couple other ones of recent note in this line are uh vast of night which is a small film that amazon prime picked up which is set in 1950s in new mexico i believe and nope that's a freaky one Oh, so, I saw I saw the trailer for that in the cinema, and it kind of stood out. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, so th- um, it's it's fun to watch these films because, of course, we're we're uh, uh, once again these filmmakers are preying on the unknown or basing it on a true story of somebody's alleged experience. Uh, it just yeah. provides a window, I guess, into our into our humanity. I think, in terms of TV, for me. 
the Twilight Zone and the X Files are the two shows that really nailed the alien topic in a masterful way. In terms of recent films, uh, I don't know if you've seen Horse Girl, but that's a really, really great film. It does have kind of an alien uh, theme running huh. throughout. It's, I mean, it's a film dealing with mental health, but yeah. the alien thing is masterfully intertwined into the plot. And it's a really great film. Ah, that reminds me of Mysterious Skin, uh, in which uh, uh, a young man claims he was abducted by aliens, but it is his his way of dealing with the trauma of being sexually assaulted and abused when he was young. And so that's wow. uh, and that's yeah, yeah it's heavy, it like, but it it, it sounds, gives you it another like, yes. it, it gives yeah. you another perspective on how or why people create these experiences, for lack of a better term, or have. Mm-hmm air quotes, have these experiences, you know, it could be replacing a traumatic event. So there's, there's a lot of reasons why people have these experiences and they run the gamut in film and TV for sure. How could I forget, of course, the first three Men in Black films with the masterful creations of Rick Baker, (laughs) unforgettable alien depictions. Yes. Of course, Men in Black, the, uh, the authority on all things aliens and abductions. Let's get to some primates' takes on lights in the sky, Frankie. Let's listen to Brooks Delight Humiliators. <laughs> It's time for Primates Takes. If you would like to participate in Primates Takes, all you have to do is go to patreon.com forward slash Tracks. One of the many benefits there is that I'll post a thread about the topic of the track up for discussion, and then you get to comment on it, and I'll read it right here, uh, assuming I don't bungle my own words and yours. Let's go to the thread. Boy, it's taken a while to load, Frankie. Uh, Ryan Rashawn says, This signals the start of my favorite sequence on the album. As good as Purple Onion has been, the end of the record has my favorite songs. Lights is absolutely dripping with atmosphere. I love the slow picking of the melody less starts uh, while the band around him starts building the atmosphere, which eventually crescendos, but not in an over-the-top way. Uh, Ryan just brought up something very important. It doesn't get too bombastic uh, at the end it it is controlled and i think that's a really important aspect of it they they keep it uh they keep it somewhat uh limited and in in a way it feels mature you know they don't go off the deep end there frankie jordan khan says one of my favorites in the claypool catalog paranoia is a common thread but this track best captures primal unhinged terror no brooks delight today Brooks did not destroy us today, Frankie. Thank you, Prime Matrons, and now it's time for this. Live cuts. A gem vehicle. Live cuts. The gem vehicle. Live cuts. A gem vehicle. Live cuts. A true jam vehicle. Live cuts. A gem vehicle. Live cuts. The jam vehicle. Live cuts. What's going on here? Shards of bone in my anus. <laughs> Today's live cut of Lights in the Sky is from Tipitina's 2003 in New Orleans. Is this the famed Tipitina show that went 36 hours? It is the famed Tipitina show that went over four hours. Wow. They were feeling it. One of night. the longest Les Claypool shows ever. Well, no wonder they had to bust out lights in the sky. They were filling four hours, for cripe's yeah. sake. <laughs> Even if you're playing 15-minute uh, versions of each song, you still have to play 16 songs in four hours. That's a lot of tunes. Looks like we're going to hear from Ski Rack. There's that foghorn.
like that lick. It's nice and sinister. Here it comes. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's on the record. All right. So they're they're sticking to the record. I like that. Let's hear some vocals later on in the tune. Usually when I go to 12 minutes and 45 seconds, the live cut is nearly over, but this is not the case for Lights in the Sky at Tipitina's. <laughs> They go places, right? Yeah. I Lights in the sky. I like the delivery on that one. <laughs> Very exaggerated. Uh, and I love Enor's background vocals as well. He gives great supporting vocals uh, throughout his Frog Brigade run. Is that one on Toaster, Frankie? Yeah. Tipitinas is available at Toaster. All right. Go take up all of Toaster's bandwidth and listen to Lights in the Sky from Tipitinas. I suppose uh, I should say this then. Lights in the Sky... We called your name, and you've been tracked. Next time, Frankie, uh, I'm going to jump up on the roof to clear the gutters, all right? I'll make sure not to take your ladder away. Josh. Oh, thank you so much, man. I'm scared of heights. I don't like it up here. <laughs> Primates, primatrons, people of Earth. I don't know, people who, uh, people who operate the lights in the sky, if you're people at all. Thank you all for listening. We have one more thing to do frankie it is the end of the month or i guess the beginning of the month <laughs> when this is published we have to thank our prime matrons they are the kind people over at patreon.com forward slash primus tracks that support the podcast and uh, we have to thank them for their unwavering and faithful support i still don't know why they do it frankie but they do so let's thank them the following Prime Matrons uh, stand out in our minds and our shriveled hearts. Uh, there's IDK Bai, which is a fun one to start with. Uh, we also want to thank Lance Halterman, uh, Sachiko, Tom Dastic, Brittany Ray, Wamola17, uh, the landed gentry of Edwin Allen Richards IV, uh, Matt Ray, and I get to say this every month, Deluge Nuts. Thank you, uh, our resident fish expert, Jordan Kahn, Matt Crakely, Trish. And if you're watching Primatrons on the video, this beautiful creation right here is that of Trish. Uh, Bo Campbell, Less Is More, Eric in Australia, John Gatwood, Mr. Tamby Meatfoot, Brooks Delight, who continuously kills us uh, on Primates Takes, uh, Ryan Rashawn, Joseph Pebbler, Nick in the Netherlands. Hi, Nick. Uh, Travis in Alaska, number one. Stephanie Wolfgang King. Carl Reinch. Thank you, Carl. Travis in Alaska, number two. You guys can sort it out amongst yourselves. Mike Chillian. Sarah Markham. Jesse Calton. Porter Crop. Haven't heard from Porter in a while. Summer school must be a doozy, Frankie. Uh, Anthony Del Preet. Go Bills. John Shreve. Johnny Perona, who gave us that great Primates Takes theme. Mr. Funknificent, Johanny Coho, Stephen Stang, Chris, Simon Altman, also in Australia, Mike Tuckerman, who I believe is in the wilds of Canada, Chris Gentile, Keith Thompson, Kevin, see you soon, Kevin. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. Amber uh -huh. Porter and El Patron Numero Uno, Carlos Arismendi. Thank you all so much for your continued support of this here thank you so much guys wow incredibly appreciated big time later days willie mace